I'm reading from the King James Version. Some of you have the New American Bible translation. I'm going to do as I have been. There are not as many changes that ought to be made in this letter, but I will call attention to a few things as we read the first seven verses, the letter to the church at Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church in Ephesus, not of, but in. This is the Greek preposition, epsilon nu, in. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Or he who is holding, this is a present active participle. Please observe now, present active, he is holding, or he who holds, or he is holding, the seven stars in his right hand. Who walketh, or who is walking, this is another present active participle, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, before we read any further, I'd like you to go back and let us look at verse 20 once again of chapter 1. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That is, they are the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. What we saw in chapter 1, especially the vision proper, beginning with verse 12 through 20, is the Lord Jesus walking in the midst of the seven churches. For what purpose? To judge them. Walking here denotes judgment. Walking is connected with judgment. The Lord Jesus is now presently, this is a present active participle, he is presently holding the angels, the messengers. He is presently walking, that is, in the midst, are judging the seven churches. And the seven churches, of course, are symbolic of all the churches. He's judging this church. He's judging every church. That's what he's doing presently. He's judging the churches. Why? Because judgment must begin at the house of God, 1 Peter 4, 17. And if the righteous be saved with difficulty, what about the ungodly? What about the sinners? Verse 2. I know thy works are your deeds and thy labor and thy patience or thy endurance or perseverance, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, or with them who are evil. Notice the intolerance. Beloved, there is a place for tolerance in the lives of God's people, and there is a place for intolerance. Are we willing to accept that? I said, there is a place for tolerance, and there is a place for no tolerance. That is, we're to be intolerant. We're to be tolerant with certain things and intolerant with other things. That means, beloved, when you find these religionists, these church members who are just tolerant with everything, you put it down, they have nothing. I'm speaking plainly. Anyone who has been saved by the grace of God, who knows the truth, he is tolerant with some things, but he is intolerant with other things. Thou canst not bear them who are evil, who say they're apostles and are not. Let's give it a practical application. Who say they're ministers of God and are not. 
You see, there are no apostles today. So we have to make a practical application out of it for the church. And has found them liars. Verse 3. And has borne. And has patience. Now here we have the repetition of the word patience. It is found in your King James Version. In verse 2 it's the same Greek word which means forbearance or endurance. Or perseverance. And for my name's sake hast labored. And hast not fainted. In other words, you've endured. Fainted literally means wearily, wearilessness. Now these are the things for which he could con commend the church at Ephesus. Now notice what he has to say beginning with verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. I have something against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. You've left your first love. What's the remedy for this? Verse 5. <clears throat> and there are three parts to the remedy. And notice the three steps that are given here. First of all, remember. I'll not go into the Greek of this. We'll do that in the exposition. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. And repent, that's step number two. And do the first works, that's step number three, or else I will come, or I'm coming. I'm coming. What coming is he talking about? Is this a providential coming, or is this the second advent of our Lord? It is the providential coming of Jesus Christ in judgment upon the church. And this, beloved, during the church age, I will come unto thee quickly. What will he do when he comes? Will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except or unless. Here we have a third class condition in the Greek, except or unless you repent. Verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Is the Christian to hate things? Yes, there are things the Christian is to hate. Have you ever heard people say, oh, that person just loves everybody, just, just seems to love everything? Now notice it also says, which I also hate. That is the Lord. We are to hate what God hates. Love that which He loves. No religionist. No mere church member who is a stranger of grace can take the teaching that we'll be giving for the next several weeks from these seven letters. Now notice in verse 7, and please observe the difference. He is no longer addressing the church as the church. He is now talking to individuals. He, he. He goes from the church in Ephesus. To the individual himself. He that hath an ear. Look at, the, look at the pronouns. Mark them. Don't forget them. He that hath an ear. Let him. Not the church. Not her. But him. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him. That overcometh. Will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's stand. <clears throat> Christ's letter to the church at Ephesus. The church 
desired by God in many respects. The church at Ephesus, which was the strongest doctrinal church of all the churches mentioned. Our Lord had some of the greatest doctrinal truths to give to the church at Ephesus that were given to any local congregation. Yet the church at Ephesus was not a perfect church. There is no perfect church. Just as there is no perfect Christian. I'm afraid that in the study of Revelation, many overlook the second division of the book. What our Lord has to say to the churches of Jesus Christ during this dispensation of grace. I said to you last Sunday that if I were judging this church by the churches, we could have many commendable things to say, but when I would judge this church by the word of God, there are not many things for which I could commend. That's true in my own individual life. That's true in yours. The closer one gets to the Lord, the more he sees of himself. The closer the church gets to the Lord, the more she sees herself in the light of the revelation of God's mind. We're living in an apostate age. We're living in an age when there is a form of godliness, but very, very little manifestation of spiritual power. Someone might say, well, what about all the large churches that are growing so rapidly today? But that's no indication that they're churches. They may be just country clubs with religious names. You say, I don't like that statement. Well, you can take it up with somebody else. I just made it. And there's no apology for having made it. How does one judge a church? By the written revelation of the mind of God. And we saw that in our study last week. I want to begin this morning by asking a question that is a very heart-searching one. Do you know what the major difference is between physical and spiritual illness? I want you to answer that one before I go any further. That is to yourself. Do you know what the major difference is between physical and spiritual illness? You might ask, well, why are you raising the question? For the simple reason that Ephesus did not recognize her spiritual condition. And, beloved, it just may be that you and I are not recognizing our true spiritual condition. Thus, in failure to recognize our own personal spiritual condition, we do not have the proper perspective Therefore, we may not know the true spiritual condition, and we wouldn't if we don't, knew our, we don't know our own, of the church of which we are a member. I wonder today how many church members of various churches really know their own spiritual condition and the spiritual condition of the institution to which they belong. Blood, this is a real probing question, and I intend for it to be. What is the major difference between physical and spiritual illness? It's very simple. One recognizes his physical illness, but he doesn't recognize his spiritual illness. Now let me prove my point. Out of over 42 years 
of pastoral experience, get this, I can name on this hand the number of people who have ever requested for this preacher to pray for their spiritual condition. Will you think about that for a moment? I can't really remember when the last person asked me to pray for his or her spiritual condition. Do you know why? The person doesn't recognize his or her spiritual condition. Yet, beloved, very few days may pass when I will have someone to request that I pray for their physical condition. That's pretty probing, isn't it? I'm just telling you like it is. So what is the major difference between physical and spiritual illness? The physical is recognized immediately, whereas the spiritual is not. How does that grab you? Would you be willing to admit that? Beloved, if every Christian recognized a decline in his spiritual life and was as anxious for its recovery as he is for physical recovery, why, the church would be an entirely different institution, spiritually speaking. Pretty heart-searching, isn't it? I'm not going to go into a long history of Ephesus. That's an interesting study within itself. One would have to go back to the 19th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, and there you have the history that Luke gives us of the church at Ephesus. Then you have, of course, the epistle to the church in Ephesus, six chapters in length, a great doctrinal treatise. It has doctrine. It has practice. It has warfare. All of these things are presented in those six chapters. But now the Lord is giving to John this brief letter, six verses in length, to be given to the church in Ephesus. We have in verses 1 through 3, we might call this the commendation. And also you would put in connection with that verse 6 because there is a commendable statement made in verse 6. Let's begin with verse 1 this morning. Let's read it once again. Under the angel of the church are the messenger of the church in Ephesus. Right. Now let's pause for a moment. Right. Here we have an Arius active imperative. In other words, you do it and you do it quickly. You write. These things, saith he, who is holding the seven stars, In his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, there are two things I'd like for us to observe. First of all, notice the word holdeth. Here we have a present active participle. The word walketh is another present active participle. He is holding now. The true messenger of each particular true church in his hand. And, beloved, no weapon that is formed against God's true servant will ever prosper. Isaiah 54, 17. Why? Because he called, he ordained, he cares for, he holds him in his hand. 
I'm giving an overall look at this, and then we'll start breaking it down. And secondly, not only is he holding this present active participle, but he is walking another present active participle. He is now walking in the midst of the churches. And walking denotes judgment, as we'll see in just a few minutes. So to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the word angel is angelos. This letter was not written to the spirit of the church. And notice too, beloved, this may surprise you, this letter was addressed to the angel and not to the church. Now, what does that tell us? The church was in such a spiritual state that our Lord addressed the letter to the angel rather than to the church. But he intended for the message that he gave to the angel or the messenger for him to give it to the church. Therefore, the messenger stands between the Lord and the church. There are some who say that it was addressed to the angel, and they believe the angel is the literal angel. No, beloved, in the study of the Old Testament or New, the word angelos is also used for messenger as well as a literal angel. And it certainly does not speak or refer to the spirit of the church at Ephesus. Let us look at something else. It is addressed to the angel, not to a heavenly creature, if you please. A letter would not be written to a heavenly creature. It was not addressed to a bishop, get this now, not to a bishop in the sense of the bishop of the Methodist church or the bishop of the Catholic church or the bishop of the Episcopal church. You see, I'm giving it to you as it is. For no one stands in that capacity. The Bible does not teach such bishops as many religious denominations have. So this letter is addressed not to a heavenly creature, not to a bishop in the sense of a diocese, not a heavenly creature to carry the message from John to the church. It is not by but to to the minister or presiding elder of the local congregation. Now, a person can chew with that all he wants to, but that's what it says. Beloved, I must tell you this morning that this and the truth that this verse contains has kept me where I belong for more than 40 years. I claim its promise, and I claim it again today. So angel is used in the Old Testament to denote a prophet in Haggai 1.13. It is used in speaking of a priest in Malachi 2.7. Thus it is used as a name of office and is given to the ministering servants, servants of God, is also used to denote an uncreated being. So I'm giving you the different ways the word angelos is used in the Scriptures. This letter was written to the messenger of the church in Ephesus. Whereas the epistle, get this, now notice the difference between this little letter and the epistle, six chapters in length. The epistle was written to the saints. Will you make that distinction, please? This little letter was written to whom? The messenger. Whereas the epistle was written to the saints in Ephesus. So things 
in the church had sunk so low that the Lord addressed the members through the presiding messenger or officer of the church. You'll notice the plurality of elders is not mentioned here. Yet the Bible teaches the plurality of elders, but the plurality of elders is not mentioned here. Why? Because there has always been, there shall always be someone in charge. There has to be the presiding officer in the church. Notice it says he holds the seven stars or he's holding the seven stars in his right hand. The stars are the angels, of course, are the messengers. Chapter 1, verse 16, verse 20, and chapter 2, verse 1. A star shines, but the light that is derived from the star does not originate with the star. And the light that is reflected from the messenger does not originate with the messenger. When I heard this doctor say last week that he considered doctors as medical deities, I could not help but compare with that all of these so-called divine healers that you hear and see so much on television today. They're just about taking all the programs. I'm talking about the charismatics. And there's just as much ego in one of them. as there is in the doctor who feels that he can medically cure a person. So the stars of the messengers are in the protecting and controlling hand of him who calls and ordains. You and I must admit there are many who go forth, but God has not called them. And the Bible speaks of them. So the right hand denotes one who is on the offense. I said the right hand in the Scriptures denotes one who is on the offense. Christ is on the offense. And I wish I had time this morning to go into some of these Scriptures with you, but I'll just mention a few references. Matthew 26 64, Acts 2, 25, 33 and 34, Acts 5, 31, Ephesians 1, 20, Hebrews 1, 3, etc., etc. The left hand in the study of the Scriptures denotes defense. 2 Corinthians 6, 7. God is not on the defense. He's on the offense. Then notice it says, and it'll take some time to develop this, Christ is walking in the midst of the lampstands. This is the lampstand period. This is the age of grace. This is the church age, if you please. So here we have walking, present, active, participle. And this must be distinguished from sitting. Here he's walking. Now don't forget Hebrews 1.3. After having finished the work the Father sent him to perform, we find in Hebrews 1.3 we see him sitting at the Father's right hand. Do you know the difference between Christ walking and Christ sitting? In the study of the Scriptures, when you find references made to him sitting, that denotes intercession on behalf of his people. That's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews 1.3. Here, however, when we see him walking, present, active, participle, he's walking, this denotes judgment. Judgment. Now, before we go any further, we're going to have to spend a little time on this. Whether we like to or not, we must. We must give the truth of this passage. D. 
Did you know, beloved, the kingdom is in full view with the judgment of the churches? Even the coming kingdom is in full view with Christ's present judgment of the churches. Stay with me and you'll see what I'm going to reveal in just a moment. Believers must be judged to be qualified for judgment in the kingdom. Now, did you know this? Maybe you've overlooked this. I'm afraid many of us have. I did for a number of years in my study of the Scriptures. There is a two-fold judgment of Christians. Please don't forget that. This is so important. I have not dealt with this before, just in this manner. There is a two-fold judgment of Christians. We're now looking at the first judgment of Christians. It is going on now, presently, in the dispensation of grace. There is another judgment of saints, and it will be before the judgment seat of of Jesus Christ. The twofold judgment is important to understand. Christ is walking in the midst of the churches, judging them presently. He is not here. We're not standing before Him personally. When He speaks here in this epistle, in this brief letter, I'm coming, I'm coming. If you do not repent and do the first works, I'm coming and I'll remove the candlestick of the lampstand. That means His coming providentially. His coming providentially. Providentially He will come. Providentially He's dealing with you and me now. Providentially He's judging you and me now. The second judgment will be when we stand, 2 Corinthians 5.10, before the Bema of Christ. This twofold judgment, however, is in keeping. It is in accord with the coming kingdom. Let's go a little further. Both the righteous and wicked are judged. And many Bible students do not make the proper distinction between the judgment of the wicked and the judgment of the righteous. will not be judged all at the same time. The judgment of the righteous precedes the judgment of the wicked. Beloved, the righteous will participate in the judgment of the wicked. Therefore, the judgment of the righteous must precede the judgment of the wicked. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? We're going to sit with Him. We're going to reign with Him. We're going to judge with Him, who is our Savior and our Lord. So both the righteous and the wicked are judged, but they're judged at different times, get this, and secondly, for different purposes. At different times and for different purposes. I'll not elaborate on that. This will be explained more and more as we continue to progress in our study of the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is order in the twofold judgment of the righteous. The twofold judgment calls for one in the present and one in the future. And I'm talking about his judgment in the present now. Christ's present judgment is described in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. This judgment is related to one main thing. And what is it? The removal of the candlestick, the lampstand. It's what we're told here. 
You can't get around it. The future judgment is to determine the position of rulership in the kingdom. Let me just cite two biblical examples. There are many, but I'll just cite two. Luke 19, beginning with verse 12 through 19, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. You remember the nobleman who went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return? The Lord Jesus was speaking, and he was likening himself to the nobleman. And when he receives the kingdom from the Father, he will return. And you remember, he bequeathed certain things to the disciples when he left. And they were to be faithful while he was away. Jesus Christ is away, so to speak, today. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, but he's also walking in the midst of the candlesticks or the lampstands, judging. Judging you, judging me. We're told in the 19th chapter of the gospel according to Luke in that tremendous parable that our Lord gave of the nobleman. You who have been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler, ruler over many. But do you remember the one who took the talent that was given him and he hid it in a napkin? Do you remember what our Lord said to him? Don't forget, thou wicked one. So the twofold judgment is important to understand. Now there is a graduation of rank, power, and authority among the saints of God in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 41, when you have time to look at it. Now let's look at a few verses. Let's get them in the proper perspective. We're told in Romans 14, 10, and 12, every person is responsible, and here Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome. Every man must give an account of himself to God. So you're going to have to give an account of yourself. I'm going to have to give an account of myself. When? When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then we're told in Matthew 12 and verse 36 that everything will be judged. Everything. Men shall give an account even of every idle word spoken. That gets down to the most minute detail, doesn't it? So every idle word spoken, you and I will have to give an account when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then you'll find in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, all Christians will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord, and some will be rewarded and others will lose their reward. That's what it says. Now, I'd like for us to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 for a moment. I'll just give you the highlights of it. First of all, believers who build upon the foundation. It is believers who build upon the foundation. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read that. I hope we get beyond the first verse this morning, but we may not. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's begin with the with the 11th verse. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, and notice the two different kinds of materials used. Well, six things are mentioned, but the two basic materials. Gold, silver, precious stones. Those are the durable ones. Wood, hay, and stubble. They're not durable. 
verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Salvation is not in view here at all. It's reward. Now let's observe these six things. First of all, it is believers who build upon the foundation. Secondly, all who build upon Christ are saved. Thirdly, some suffer loss, but some receive a reward. Fourthly, reception of reward is conditioned on, get this, conditioned on the materials used in building. Fifthly, loss is caused by worthless materials, wood, hay, stubble. And lastly, Every man's work shall be manifested. Why? Because his work will be tested. His work will be tested. Now, I wonder if you have done this in the study of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia. Actually, there are three things that could be said about all of these, or each of these. Let me point these things out in our introduction at this point. Christ is presented to each church according to her particular need. To her particular need. It is interesting to observe that each of the seven different presentations of Jesus Christ is mentioned in chapter 1. Let me point those out. Here, the Lord Jesus is presented as the one who is holding the seven stars and walking in the midst of the candlesticks. Well, where is that found in chapter 1, verse 20? Now let's go to the second. The letter to the church of Smyrna. In the letter to the church of Smyrna, the Lord Jesus Christ is presented as the one who said of himself, I'm the first and the last, who was dead and alive forevermore. Here Christ's eternal existence and suffering comforted the suffering saints in Smyrna. Now, why did our Lord say what he did in the letter to the church at Ephesus? and introduced himself as the one who's holding the seven stars and walking in the midst of the candlesticks because of the condition of Ephesus. He was about to come and remove the lampstand. The suffering saints at Smyrna, not a word of condemnation about the suffering saints. So here they needed comfort. Therefore the Lord Jesus began this epistle, this little letter, to comfort these saints by saying, I'm the first and the last. This teaches the eternal existence of those suffering saints. I was dead, but I'm alive. Jesus Christ, therefore, he presented himself in the very area where the church was lacking. I want you to see this. In each of these letters, he presents himself in a different manner. And in each presentation, it has already been mentioned in the first chapter. Let's look at something else. The major problem within each church is as follows. Each church had a major problem. Ephesus' problem was departure from first love. Smyrna's problem was tribulation, suffering. The problem of Pergamum was the seat of Satan's activity. Now get this. You mean the church at Pergamum was the seat of Satan's activity? That's exactly what the, the little letter says. Do you mean to tell me, preacher, 
There are local institutions today that are nothing but the very seats of the activity of the devil himself. That's what our Lord said. Can you accept it? I have no problem with it. I've seen a lot of them, so have you. Now let's go to the second. The letter to the church of Smyrna. In the letter to the church of Smyrna, the Lord Jesus Christ is presented as the one who said of himself, I'm the first and the last, who was dead and alive forevermore. Here Christ's eternal existence and suffering comforted the suffering saints in Smyrna. Now, why did our Lord say what he did in the letter to the church at Ephesus? and introduced himself as the one who's holding the seven stars and walking in the midst of the candlesticks because of the condition of Ephesus. He was about to come and remove the lampstand. The suffering saints at Smyrna, not a word of condemnation about the suffering saints. So here they needed comfort. Therefore the Lord Jesus began this epistle, this little letter, to comfort these saints by saying, I'm the first and the last. This teaches the eternal existence of those suffering saints. I was dead, but I'm alive. You may be suffering, but take heart, suffering ones. You're going to be in the first resurrection. Then notice the next, the third letter to the church at Pergamos or Pergamum. He is presented here as having the sharp sword with two edges. You know why? Because the church at Pergamum was much married, united to things that they should not be united to. And the Lord must sever those connections. So he's the judge. Notice the next one, Thyatira. And in this... He is presented as the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished brass. That too speaks of punishment. Where is that found? Verse 14 of chapter 1. These denote discernment and judgment of what? Fornication for which Thyatira was guilty. Spiritual fornication. You remember the woman Jezebel? Then look at the letter to the church of Sardis. Here the Lord Jesus is presented as the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And this is found in chapter 1, verse 4, 116 and 120. Look at Philadelphia. But before we go any further, talking about Sardis, Sardis was the church that had a name to live but was dead. Dead. So you can understand the way the Lord presented himself to this church. There was not only need for spiritual power, the stars have a tremendous responsibility. Notice the letter to the church of Philadelphia and how he introduces himself. As the holy and true who has the key of David. The key of David. That goes back to verse 4. In verse 5 of chapter 1. And then it also, you see, the faithful, he's the faithful one. And also, verse 18, he has the keys of death, or he has the authority of death and Hades. Finally, Laodicea. He represents himself as the faithful and true witness. Why? You remember Laodicea? Rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. Neither cold nor hot, just lukewarm. And Christ said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Here there was a declining confidence in the testimony of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he presented himself in the very area where the church was lacking. I want you to see this. In each of these letters, he presents himself in a different manner. And in each presentation, it has already been mentioned in the first chapter. Let's look at something else. 
the major problem within each church is as follows. Each church had a major problem. Ephesus' problem was departure from first love. Smyrna's problem was tribulation, suffering. The problem of Pergamon was the seat of Satan's activity. Now get this. You mean the church at Pergamum was the seed of Satan's activity? That's exactly what the, the little letter says. Do you mean to tell me, preacher, there are local institutions today that are nothing but the very seats of the activity of the devil himself? That's what our Lord said. Can you accept it? I have no problem with it. I've seen a lot of them, so have you. Let's go a little further. What was the problem with Thyatira? The problem with Thyatira was Jezebel, the fornicator and corrupter. What was the problem with Sardis? Dead because of personal defilement. There was only a few who had not defiled their garments with the flesh. What about Philadelphia? Not a word of condemnation about Philadelphia. Yet we find that there was opposition from the synagogue of Satan. And that was the problem that Philadelphia had. What I'm saying, beloved, is if you and I think we're going to get out without problems, you're mistaken. Then looking lastly at Laodicea. Self-complacency, rich, increased with goods. We have need of nothing, neither cold nor hot. And our Lord said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. So self-complacency was the result of declining confidence in the testimony of Jesus Christ. Lastly, in looking at three major things about these churches, the promise to the overcomer, in each church is as follows. Ephesus, given to eat of the tree of life. Smyrna, exemption from the second death. Pergamum, three things are mentioned. Hidden manna, white stone, and new name. Thyatira, power over the nations. Sardis, clothed in white raiment. Philadelphia made a pillar in the temple of God. Laodicea sit with Christ in his throne. Now, beloved, I could just shorten that with just one word. But I want you to see this. Were these churches entering into that prophetic era known as the day of the Lord? As all millennialists teach, absolutely not. We have not entered into it yet. Was the beast of Daniel and Revelation fulfilled in Nero? My answer is no. But look at this before we leave the judging, walking in the midst of the seven lampstands. The seven letters record Christ's judicial verdicts. Judicial verdicts, warnings, and promises. Please don't forget those three things. What we have in Jesus Christ is standing. That's what we have in Christ. What we have in ourselves is condition. Do you know the difference between position and condition? Between standing and state? I'm assuming that you do. Now let's look at verse 2. Actually, we've taken the whole time this morning, almost an hour on verse 1. And we haven't really touched it. We haven't really touched it. But beginning with verse 2, what do we have? 
I know, I know thy works, labor, perseverance, you cannot bear, you cannot tolerate those who are evil. You've tried them who say that they're apostles and you found them out to be liars. You've borne, you've had endurance for my name's sake, you've labored, you have not painted, you've endured. Verse 6, we're dropping down to verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The head of the church has minute knowledge of, ser of the services of his people. The word for know here is not the ordinary word used in the Greek for know, gnosko. It is the word oida. And oida, beloved, is a very strong word. It means to perceive. It means to discern. It means to pay attention, to observe, to notice. And this is what our Lord is doing as He walks among the lampstands. So this word emphasizes better the absolute clearness of mental vision which photographs all the facts of the life or of life as it passes. That's what our Lord sees. Everything is open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Yes, the writer of Hebrews said, everything is open and naked under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 The things discerned by Jesus Christ were, and let's mention them, and we'll try to go as rapidly as possible. First of all, their works their works. He said, I know your works, and there were some commendable things about their works, especially in the light of their doctrinal soundness and stability. Today we see work without doctrine, and sometimes we see doctrine without work. Now think about that for a moment. Ephesus was a strong church doctrinally. And beloved, there are many churches today that have been doctrinally oriented. But yet their works are not what they ought to be. That was Ephesus. That was Ephesus. Doctrinal sound. You see, it isn't enough for you and me to say, Oh, I believe thus and so. I believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. I believe that salvation is holy of the Lord. But the life is not up with the doctrinal statement. It is lagging way behind. So I know your works. I know your labor. The Ephesians did not take the line of least resistance as many do today. They did not take it easy. They earnestly contended for the faith once delivered to the saints. And the Greek word that is used here for labor means intense labor, beloved. It doesn't just mean labor, it means intense labor. It means labor united with trouble. It means labor united with toil. With toil. And labor intensely. Then notice what he says about their patience, and this is the Greek word which literally means endurance of perseverance.
So the same words, work, labor, and patience are used by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. And this is interesting. But in that passage, they are qualified by the virtues of faith, love, and hope. Please make note of that. Please make note of that. The same words, the same order, work, labor, and patience that is used here, this same order that's used here is used in 1 Thessalonians 1. But in 1 Thessalonians 1, these words are qualified by faith, love, and hope. Work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. You see the difference? In Revelation 2.2, the virtues are omitted. Do you know why the virtues are omitted? Because Ephesus had already left her first love. And I'm so anxious to get into that, but we can't get into it until tonight. So there was a lot of formality with Ephesus. The labor was no more than just intestinal fortitude. Think of that. It was more of an intestinal fortitude than it was love. Love. And the patience, we might say, was uninspired. That was Ephesus' condition. No wonder the Lord said, nevertheless, I have something against you. You've left your first love. And by the way, the word left is a strong word, and we'll get into that one tonight, too. But notice next. He even spoke of their intolerance. Their intolerance of evil or bad men. And how thou canst not bear or endure evil or bad men. So they disciplined the morally and mentally corrupt. Nothing wrong with discipline. Ministerial courtesy had no place in Ephesus. It had absolutely no place whatsoever in Ephesus. You know, I hear so many people say today, doesn't a person have a right to believe whatever he wants to believe? Yes, but not be a member of this church. The Mormon can believe in baptism for the dead, in salvation by proxy. The Mormon can deny there is an eternal hell. He can believe that rod if he wants to, but he can't. no person can believe that and be a member of this church. I'd have to be intolerant with that. But there are some things that you're tolerant with. Here's a young Christian. He hasn't grown in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. There are many things he doesn't understand. So the stronger to bear with the weak, as we're told in Romans chapter 14. Wait a minute, preacher. What about now? I have a right to believe what I want to believe. You know, there was an interesting program on the TV this last week. They were showing a program on cults. Did you know that Mormonism is no longer considered a cult? Do you know why Mormonism is no longer considered a cult? Because it is now an established religion. Beloved, I'm here to tell you Mormonism is still a cult. It is still heretical. It's a heresy. I don't care what one thinks about the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and all the political influence that Mormonism has. It's a cult. It's a deadly heresy. But in the eyes of the religious world, whenever a religion that at one time was considered a cult, when it becomes an established religion, it is no longer a cult. 
Do you see where we are? Beloved, I hope you take inventory here at this point and see where we are. So here, the people in Ephesus were strong doctrine. They knew the doctrine. They put people to the test. Beloved, the Bible says, test, test. And they were found out to be liars. Then notice what else he says. Their wearilessness. You haven't fainted. You haven't fainted. And then their hatred. Why, have you ever heard a pious church member say, you should not hate anyone? Beloved, I challenge you to read the 139th division of the Psalms. You want me to shock you a little bit this morning? Turn to the 139th division of the psalm. Let's listen to the psalmist, a man after God's own heart. After God's own heart. Let's read, if you will, please. And this is a psalm of David, a man after God's own heart. Let's see what he says. And he was inspired to say this. Let's begin with verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Are you ready for the next verses? For they speak against thee wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them? Do not I hate them? Not their deeds. Do not I hate them? Now don't pull that passage, please, in Matthew chapter 5 on me at this point. I don't want to have to spend tonight going into that passage. Thou love your enemies. Don't, don't, don't pull that one on me. See, you might not have thought of it if I hadn't said that, but I thought I'd just say it and beat you to it. So listen to this. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not, am, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. Perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You'll notice that our Lord even commended the Ephesians for hating the evil and the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And the interesting thing about this is, a little further on in these letters, the deeds of the Nicolaitans finally become the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And haven't you seen people? They do this, they do that, and after a while they're doing of this and they're doing of that. Those things become their doctrinal belief. So the deeds of the Nicolaitans become the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. He said, which I also hate. I want to work up to our point tonight. So he had some commendable things to say about the Ephesians. But then it comes to the condemnation. The condemnation. And I'll leave off with this. Until tonight. You've left your first love. What do you think that means? I'll tell you the way it is usually explained. It is usually explained by using as an example a man and his wife. When they first get married, oh, the love that each has for the other. And then after a while, that kind of wanes. 
That's not the meaning of the word here at all. Does that surprise you? Did you know the word for first here is the same word? Now get me, follow me. The word that is used for first here is the same Greek word that is used for the best robe placed on the prodigal when he returned. When the father said, put on him the best. The first, the best. Now what is its meaning? We'll get into that tonight. And unless you and I, unless each church of Jesus Christ returns to its first love, I'm coming, I'm on my way, I'll remove the lampstand. I want to ask you a question this morning. Where is the lampstand in Ephesus today? It's gone. Where is the lampstand of Smyrna? It's no longer in existence. Where is the lampstand of Pergamum? It is no longer in existence. Where is the lampstand of Thyatira? It's no longer in existence. It's been removed. Where is the lampstand of Sardis? Where is the lampstand of Philadelphia? Where is the lampstand of Laodicea? They've all been removed. What's going to happen to the lampstand of this church? It too will be removed. When? I don't know. Now, I want to ask you a real sober question. If you believe in the, stro in, in the strict localist concept of the church, and those Baptists who think they can trace their lineage clear back to the first church at Jerusalem, where is the lampstand in Jerusalem? Where is the lampstand in Ephesus? He turns from the church and deals with the individual in each instance. Let's stand as we're seeing what's